you know, I mean, on the off chance that Trump does something crazy or whatever, I want to, I want to see it. I can at least stomach it for half an hour or something like that. So, uh, you no, know, I, I've watched every minute of both of them. And I watch a lot of the, the primary stuff too. Um, very, very entertaining election, election season for sure. My, my favorite one ever. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's both a favorite and just a terror. I mean, Oh, whatever, everybody. Uh, you know we're all recording and we're just talking now and the show has started. And what better way to start a show than to be talking about all the shit you're trying to avoid in the world? So, <laughs> I'm Mike Offlin and that's Matt Grady laughing at me being me as I admonish the both of us for talking about current events. And you were listening to whatever the fuck we call this thing here at halfguard.com and now I'm done hosting and Matt can do whatever. All right, so there there was no big show this past weekend, which is where we typically start. I mean, there were a couple little shows maybe we can touch on later, but um, I guess the biggest news of the week uh, broke on Monday. Um, George St. Pierre was um, on the MMA Hour with Ariel Helwani, and it's kind of old news now, but I thought we could break it down a little bit. Um, St. Pierre claimed that he is now a free free agent because he was not offered a fight by the UFC within a reasonable amount of time. He said that his attorney, James Quinn, had terminated terminated his contract with the UFC, and he's now free to fight anywhere. Um, again, this is St. Pierre's claim. The UFC put out a statement saying GSP remains under an existing agreement with Zufa as his MMA promoter. Zufa intends to honor its agreement with GSP and reserves its rights under the law to St. Pierre to do the same. Um, so, you know, the UFC Zufa is still claiming he's under contract. He can't go anywhere. St. Pierre is claiming the opposite. Usually how these things end up is in a courtroom. Do um, you see it going that way, Mike? Um, I don't know. I mean, I don't know if it ends up in a courtroom just because I can't – I just can't picture St. Pierre signing with Bellator. I just – I mean, this guy could have come back at any time to fight. And if it's about money, he would have could have just been the UFC making money. Uh, so I, I really do take him at his word that he kind of wants to challenge himself and do well. And I, leaving the UFC to go to Bellator, I, I, I don't see that happening. Uh, but I, I, I do think yeah. that they end up, you know, working it out on on some level. I mean, it's the. I mean, the whole story has been kind of odd because I don't want to say for years, but St. Pierre's been out about three years now since. Um, his last fight where he beat Hendricks in that real close decision. Um, since that time, he said he was going to take a little time off. He never used the word retirement. Um, and off and on, he's been doing mini camps and talking about coming back. There was the, uh, um, you know, the appearance at, at the McGregor, McGregor Diaz fight. It looked like he was interested in coming back for a while, but the whole time he's been saying this and kind of moving in that direction, white, has been saying the opposite. He has no heart. He doesn't want to fight anymore. He's got a lot of money. Um, and kind of just downplaying St. Pierre. Um, so the whole situation's been odd all along. I mean, if you just use common sense, you're probably assuming when St. Pierre signed his last contract in 2011, UFC has seen quite a few changes. Obviously, they've added USADA. There's the Reebok deal. Um, you can't have sponsors anymore. Now there's new owners. Um, so a lot has changed in the time St. Pierre's been on his sabbatical. Um, so, I mean, obviously, a lot of those changes play into it as well. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I suspect that it all, it all sounds like it comes down to the, probably the sponsorships thing, but I, I mean, it, it's all just up. It's all complete speculation. Nobody's seen the contract. I don't know if he's got you know a traditional UFC contract. I would imagine that his contract would have been largely the same as most guys, but with a little bit more fine tuned wording, just given the position he would have been at when he re- renegotiated it. But uh, mm. I mean, it, re- reading some of this stuff here and there. I mean, it sounds like they kind of offered him a fight, and he, they, he said it wasn't quick enough or whatever. I, I know I didn't hear what his attorney said uh, earlier today uh, about it, 
the re- his reasoning for this, but I imagined from the get go that it was something just basically a lack of good faith on the UFC's part and shit like that. But um, I, I saw something where it said they gave him uh, like uh, ten days to give send him about a yeah with somebody. And, and the thing is, and that they they like I don't know if they shot him a text or what happened, but something about Robbie Lawler. But there was no date, there was no location, there was no event. Well, the, yeah, um, it, so they didn't take it serious, and they did it at like the last possible like moment. Oh, I, I'm um, sure they is, didn't. Is I'm, I'm sure thing. they didn't take it seriously. And the thing is, is that I, I don't think that that's really something that you can that is in St. Peter's hands, you know, I mean, the contract is not, he's arguing that it is voidable by either party for certain reasons, but if the UFC has, says, we have you, we have to offer you so many fights within so many years, this is what the deal is, basically, and if they haven't, I mean, if you want to say the UFC's never offered you a fight prior to two seconds before this, I guess you could say that something isn't being reasonably done by the UFC, but I, 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 I yeah, and I can remember I, the, the past. There was a show in Montreal where they even offered him a fight. Like I, I don't remember the the specifics, but I remember hearing about that. And White claimed he turned it down. Yeah, and, and again, the other thing is, I, I can't without seeing the contract itself. I don't know if you know. I, I can see them saying, "Well, you didn't really offer us a fight because you offered us a fight at the." numbers of the previous deals but the numbers of the previous deals don't include the lost sponsorship revenue so you haven't really right. honestly offered us a fight and i mean like it, it would be, it's all going to be very very uh contract language heavy uh it would never go to i don't think it would ever go to trial or anything this is something that realistically if, if a judge wanted to they could get it done quicker uh but for for gs how, how does how does claiming he's a free agent benefit GSP? It's just kind of a power play, right? I mean, legally, he I mean, he can't legally go and sign with Bellator right now, correct? Well, I mean, that's the thing. It's why he went out and did it, um, I'll get to that in a second, I guess. As far as can he go out and sign with Bellator, I mean, his – this isn't like it's illegal. I mean, illegal is, I guess, the term, but it's not like the risk if he does is he goes to jail. The risk is that he has to go to the fight in the UFC for millions or whatever. And I guess in theory, if you say that you're a free agent, like if, if you're if you're telling the UFC, look, we don't think that this contract is valid between the two us, we have to, uh, you know, the t- contract is therefore terminated, then I guess in theory you would tell everybody. You know, normally it would be the UFC's release you or whatever, but this was his way of saying and. I, I think on, they probably have to have some discussion or something to uh, show that they're serious. That said, I mean, if you're Bellator, do you really want to get into this kind of weird territory given everything you just went through with Quentin Jackson? So uh, I think that this, um, if, it, if this is successful for St. Pierre, I feel like this is uh, – it could be a monumental game changer if it's going to go his way because it's going to be a total upending of – contracts and everything but sure. yeah, I think he's more likely just gonna either settle or it's gonna just go away when nobody wants to do the work um, I mean the, the weird to me one of the weirder parts of it is he can't get that money even even if UFC's lowballing him like the, there's rumors he's looking for 10 million dollars which sounds like a lot of money for a fight but Where's he going to go and get five million dollars? <laughs> you know what I mean? If UFC is offering seven five, that's still a hell of a lot more money than Bellator is going to pay him to fight on Spike. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I um, guess in theory, I mean, like, if you're Bellator and you have the chance, maybe you do it just to do it. But that seems like it's. But what's the return on oh, investment? I, you'd have to be just banking like crazy that the. <laughs> that you're getting basically ten million dollars worth of advertising from it. I don't think that I don't think it would make financial, you know, immediate financial sense. I don't think you could quantify it. But I, I could see yeah. somebody being if I come being like, wait, so he's available? Well, this just feels like it's something a big star, and maybe we could, and then they could actually say, hey, wait, we could do a pay per view. Yeah, and, I mean, the, the question that would obviously be what what kind of draw? How big of a draw is Saint Pierre without the UFC? And granted, you know, he's probably the now probably the fourth biggest draw in the history of the sport between 
you know, McGregor, Rousey, and Lesnar. Um, so obviously he's a huge, huge star, but there's something about buying a Bellator pay-per-view <laughs> that it doesn't have the same appeal. You know? Yeah, no, I mean, it would be different, but again, because he is just one of these historical stars, it's way beyond anything else. What Again, if you're Bellator, you can offer a pay-per-view with him on top. But you can also have, you know, Benson Henderson and a couple of other guys from like the UFC who, when they left, were by no means washed up. And so you can kind of like make it look like a semi UFC type ish card. And uh, sure. again, yeah, it, throw Rory on there, Mitri. Yeah, on, and suddenly guys. it goes. Oh, it looks like a UFC card. Hey, I like some. Of, I know some of those guys. Uh, again, it's not like you could build for the future like pro wrestling necessarily. But I think St. Pierre is just so. Just massive, beyond just massive, uh, that, you know, I mean, I'm not saying that he's doing a million buys with Bellator or anything like that, but I could see it breaking 500,000, no problem. And at that, if that paid, at that breaking point, Bellator could probably pay him about $10 million. I mean, it'd be a lot more of a higher percentage of what usually, uh, gets paid by promoters, but it, it sure. could work in theory, I guess. Yeah, um, Legally, do you think would could he legally be better off if he self promoted a fight in Montreal? Like, what if he sold out, you know, that arena in Montreal and put it on pay per view? You know how like Mayweather and the and the big boxers do their own own promotion, that sort of thing. Get a hundred percent of the cut, pay his people, pay the production, and just keep all the money himself. If he's not hired and doesn't sign with anyone else, does that make a difference? Uh, I mean, legally. That would be weird. Uh, I, 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 I think do. that it, I think that it would. Uh, <laughs> I, I think it would just be that a judge wouldn't permit that. It wouldn't fly. It would just be like that's just that yeah. no, because you're actually in a new promotion. There is a promotion there. Something is promoting you, and they're promoting the other guys. You're not all just randomly showing up and having your own like ten guys and ten pr different promotion companies or whatever. So it would be it would be a new promotion. So. Uh, yeah, uh, it's A for effort though. That's pretty good though. That's not, it's not, it's better than a lot of things that you could do. Like, like <laughs> all you could really do is like, I don't know, run a show in some, uh, island or something like that where, I don't know, Russia's got something I'm sure that they'll let you run shit for, uh, illegally. Nah, I got nothing. Uh, for me, <laughs> Like on a personal level, I kind of feel bad for GSP in this whole whole situation. I, I don't know where where your head's at with it, but it's just like the guy's thirty five. He was a pretty loyal soldier for them for you know ten years, however long he he's been with them, longer than that now, um, or maybe not now since he's gone. But <laughs> either way, it's like it, it seems like he wants to fight again. He probably lost money on the sponsorship deal and the Reebok deal. And it's like he just wants to get paid what he was getting paid before, we think, and fight again. And it's like he's 35, and this thing could get drawn out for a long time. Um, but but you think he will fight again in the, the UFC, if you had to guess? If he fights again, I think it's in the UFC. Um, whether he does, I mean, I, I don't know. I, uh, I think he's always kind of – I don't want to say – he's kind of like all over the place. He's, uh, you know, GSP is a different type of dude. You know, he's got a bomb shelter designed to ward off aliens. So, yeah, I can, you, you can <laughs> understand why sometimes Dana White might be a little skeptical of what's going on there. Yeah, no, I, I, I get it. And, I mean, everybody assumes Dana's, you know, lying and full of crap, but... You know, maybe maybe there is some truth to it. I I, I don't know, but it, it's an interesting story. Um, obviously, he's the biggest star to try and do something like this. Um, whether it's a, a legitimate move to get out of the UFC or just a power play, um, it's it's a big deal, and it, it'll be a story moving forward for and, sure. And what I really um, want to throw in because it'll probably come up in sure. a second, also otherwise in other contexts, yeah, is that. Uh, this is like one of the times I've heard of one of these, you know, mega fighters, mega stars, publicly kind of bad mouthing the new ownership. This isn't, you know, Jose Aldo or whatever these guys who just don't understand. You know, St. Pierre's people said at one point, <laughs> you know, 
there are people who are like, we, we're kind of doing well with Fertitas, and then this new ownership group came in, and they were saying these things and this and that, and I, it seemed like they didn't know what they were doing or understand it. And, you know, you haven't heard that from Connor. Obviously, he seems to be happy. Rhonda is, must be happy. I don't think John Jones has an, a choice. But, uh, say, Pierre, I know. He, I bet John Jones is happy right I, now. I, I, well, he did win a, a, a Naga tournament, so. I guess he's kind of happy. And, I don't know. Yeah. Some, but it definitely does seem like, uh, this whole, this whole WMEI, whatever the hell it is, uh, this is a little bit more of a, a hands-on operation than I would have guessed when it started. Like, I figured they would have bought in and just been like, boom, all right, don't screw with this, let it be. But it sounds like their fingers meddling more and more within the promotion. Yeah, I mean, there, there's a lot going on, but which we'll get to in a little bit. But I was going to say, like, in addition to GSP, to go along with what you just said, just in the last few weeks, there's Aldo, Khabib, Juliana Pena, Kawajiri, Malaya Quinta, Luke Rockhold, and Chris Wyben all ha- kind of having these, like, I don't want to say public disputes, but they've made it clear that they're unhappy with their pay and their contract situations. Some of them want more money. Some of them want out completely. Um, but this is the first time I can remember where there's a combination of top stars, you know, your, your Wyman, Rockhold, Aldo, GSP now, um, with gripes. And then your your lower level people, Ally Ally Quinters is selling real estate wow. now. He, he's quit the <laughs> UFC over what he's he was. His, his saying, was yeah, it, it's, it, it's too totally. It, in the past, the the top stars always seemed pretty happy. They didn't complain. They would take their you know several million dollar payday and be happy with it. And now it's like everybody's got a gripe, and it, you got to wonder if some of the discontent has come because. The company was valued at the $4.2 billion, and they saw that sale. They're like, if this company sold for that much, and we were only getting paid this much, we, we've been getting hosed all along. I, I do think that uh, the, that number is going to be out there, I think, and really influencing things for a while, along with everybody just seeing exactly what's going on with Connor. Like, Rhonda, they could kind of be like, oh, well... You know, she's a, just, you know, the woman that doesn't count. Or Brock Lesnar, that's a pro wrestler. We don't count. But Connor is pure MMA in the amount of money he's making and break, bringing in. I, I really feel like a lot of guys are looking at it going, there's a lot of money in this. This isn't, like, we, mm-hmm. we're, our sport is not limited to a million at the top of the greatest ever. We can hit that two million or that f- four million. And when you get more money like that, like, Oh, I, th- I think the biggest thing really is they see that Connor is f- willing to n- negotiate. This is a guy with all this money, and he's willing to go. I, I want to do a new deal now, and he's pure. He yeah. makes business be in the front and center of his like, little character. And a lot of guys in MMA just don't do that. They're just you know dumb Brazilians or they're dumb farm boys. <laughs> That's the only thing that exists in the sport, and so like they don't bring up you know. Hey boss, I think I deserve more. It's kind of like, okay, well, yeah, we all get paid a little bit more because the UFC wants us to feel appreciated, but it's kind of like getting your 3% cost of living raise as opposed to like getting a 20% bump in payday. Right. Um, to, to go along with this, I'm not sure if you saw this story, but there was a Wall Street Journal, um, article just in the last couple days and it, it reported that the structure of the UFC sale was uh, too liberal with adjustments to earnings, which allowed for more borrowing. Um, so essentially what happened, um, and I'm not an economist by any stretch, but basically the Federal Reserve um, warned Goldman Sachs, which was one of the banks that marketed the debt to the investors who um, you know, eventually bought the UFC, and that they were basically accused of inflating the earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization, um, which is a lot of fancy words that no one cares about. But the bottom line is um, the UFC was pegged at making a profit of about $170 million, but then it was raised up to $300 million when presented to debt investors to help finance the sale. Um, and that's what allowed them to borrow $1.8 billion for the deal. So it looks like they, I don't want to say were shady, but kind of fudged the numbers a little bit so they could borrow um, 
what appeared to be a more reasonable amount of money to buy the company. Um, so I think even when the sale went through, probably one of the first shows we did together, we were both like, there's no way it's worth $4.2 billion. And it, it wasn't because they kind of tweaked the numbers um, from $170 million in profit to $300 million in profit. And I guess they based some of that on um, future payments from new television contracts and other licensing agreements. Um, it's not like it's illegal, but it looks a little a little questionable, I guess would be the best way to put it. Um, so the, the story that the company was worth $4.2 billion wasn't really accurate, even though that's what they paid for it. Yeah, that's all uh, kind of weird. Like you do get in those kind of gray areas of uh, investor fraud, and it's. But if it was, you know, private equity, it's somehow I don't know, just doubling your projected earnings on its face does sound stupid. But if they can show the math of no, it's projected earnings because we know we protecting a bigger TV contract and things like that. They're, I think that, I mean, they're legally entitled to present the rosiest version of their future earnings as long as it's a reasonably rosy. They don't have to present the most pessimistic, and it sounds like that's probably what they did. Right. But, uh, I, yeah. I mean, look, they're the ones that have to, if, yeah, all that does let them borrow money, but they still have to pay it back. So, yeah. Right. I mean, the way I kind of looked at it was, Maybe, you know, the Fertitas were saying, we'll sell it for $4 billion. You know, no, nobody's actually going to give us that. And then it's like, you know, they started digging and looking and playing with the numbers a little bit. And WME IMG didn't have the cash on hand to do it, so they had to borrow the $1.8 billion. But you can only borrow up to six times the company's profit, essentially, um, which – wasn't it didn't swing that way the the numbers didn't work um so they 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 bumped it up to the 300 million in profit so it looked more reasonable for them to borrow that money um i feel like it's just like i don't know somebody if you're a regulator and you're like they're like well we know you can't borrow that much hold on wait let me do the math again oh wait we had the profits cut in half from what they were before. Just double and, that and, number. And a couple, oh, look at that. Yeah, in a couple of years, the TV deal will be yeah. much better. You'll be like, fine. Like, oh, um, oops. Yeah. Like, no. Like, Ber- Bernie Sanders would be bullshit right now. And Bernie Madoff um, would be going, hell yeah, right now. <laughs> yeah, they're the two most different Bernies on earth, probably. Um, so basically, with, with all this debt, they all, all these people who invested in the purchase, their money back because they basically gave WME, IMG the money to buy the company. So now they got to pay those people back with interest. So there, there's going to be some interesting moves in the next, you know, several months here. Um, they're, they're clearly going to be more desperate to make money, you know, book the big money fights. Um, and keep costs down, which brings us to our next <laughs> next topic. Um, we, I actually have some segues today. Um, with, with the WME IMG purchase, there have been lot a lot of layoffs yeah, of that's um, right. top level. You didn't, just have, you didn't just have a segue. I had set that up earlier because I thought you might talk about it. So now this is a callback. <laughs> so over the last three days, and it's like executives. It's not mid-level, I mean, there could be some of that. There could be some, you know, administrative assistance being canned, too. But this looks like the more high-paid, um, more well-known executives in the company. J- just to name a few of them, Gary Cook was relieved of his duties. He was the UFC's chief global branding officer and head of international business development. He had been in the UFC since 2012, and I guess he was the CEO for Manchester City Football. So a, a pretty famous guy. Um, at one point, Dana White called him a rock star. Seemed to be doing a good job for the most part from everything we can tell. Um, Tom Wright was also let go. He was the UFC executive vice president and GM for operations in Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. Um, he played a big part in rewriting the criminal code in Canada to legalize MMA across the country. And he also got the cage ban lifted in Victoria, Australia. So he accomplished a couple things. I also think he was like, um, 
the president of the CFL. Um, granted, it's not the NFL, but still. Um, I like that the UFC is a step up from the CFL, though. I mean, <laughs> that is good. I don't know if the CFL would sell for four billion. Um, Chief Content Officer Marshall Zelaznik, um, Social Media Director Shanda Maloney, Ken Berger, Jamie Pollock, all these high level people have, have been let go, and it's not like it's just one department. It's like different people run in different parts of the world, um, social media, um, their controller, the guy who does the books was let go. Um, just a lot of just people all over where it's like they're taking managers and executives from departments and just getting rid of them, which happens all the time when – I was going to call it a hostile takeover, but when a new a new company takes over, a lot of time people get let go and they put their own people in. That that's natural in these situations. Um, but it looks like they're clearing out some of these most highly paid Zufa executives, possibly to save money and put their own people in who might be a little cheaper. Um, and I can't say that for sure, but it'll be interesting to see if these, um, you know, the terminations adversely affect the company because they're kind of chopping off several different limbs here by letting all these people go. Yeah, I mean, all those things, I mean, uh, Zell and Nick and uh, Cook, I mean, they were guys that everybody thought, all right, well, if this thing is sold, they'll move up into the Dana White type of role. Like, that's how yeah. high up they are. So them being gone... Like I look, I, I understand that companies try to restructure things when they uh, buy things, which I, I get and don't get. It's like the UFC was successful for, for a reason. You shouldn't want to like replace things wholesale. Like it's one thing like when you're like restructuring a failing business. Yeah, you get rid of every, get rid of all the dead weight. But the UFC's got a lot of apparently very efficient pieces. But nonetheless, accepting that companies will try to put their people in here and there and redo it a little bit. To do it this drastically, that's, uh, like usually you'd want to kind of ease in because whoever you're going to be putting into place, you'd hope that they kind of get what's going on, like a Sean Shelby replacing Joe Silva type of deal where you're like, all right, well, we eased in this guy and the transition is going to probably be pretty smooth. But if you're getting rid of, it sounds like, like everybody, I mean, Joe Silva's gone. The only real major person left is Dana White. I mean, yeah. I mean, yeah. Joe Silva. I mean, Dave Shaw. Dave Shoulder's gone. Burt Watson's still gone. I mean, this is just, this is just, <laughs> this is horrible. Let, well, yeah, I was gonna say, Dave Schaller, Joe Silva, and obviously Lorenzo. They left on their own volition. Uh, we think, we think they. Did. I mean, obviously Lorenzo did. He sold the company, but maybe Joe Silva and Dave Schaller knew something and got out while the getting was good. I don't know. Um, it, it, it's. It's very interesting because to a degree it also shows what kind of power Dana might have. Like, do you think Dana supports all, acts yeah. all these people? It's, is he like, oh yeah, this will save money. I'm getting 9% of the profit. Let's get rid of him. Like this, yeah. this in theory should be a nightmare for him because he's going to have a bunch of people who are less experienced, don't really know what they're, I don't want to say don't know what they're doing. I'm sure WME has a plan. Um, I mean, they, they managed to get together $4 billion. They're not dumb people by any stretch, but if I was Dana, I'd be, I was going to say pulling my hair out. Uh, but I, I would be a, a little, a little worried at this point. Yeah. Um, it, it's really weird because I th- I thought Dana would have issues not having uh, Lorenzo in particular around as a, as a balance. But I figured, you know, be, I don't want to pretend like Dana's like some retarded person you need to keep an eye on. Uh, <laughs> it's not that at all, but like him being in a comfortable environment, you would think would, would be best, for, you know, let Dana do what Dana does best. So he knows who you, you can rely on Joe Silva to do this or, or somebody else to do that or, or whatever. And fine, Lorenzo isn't going to be there. You move somebody else in there to help a little bit. And maybe, okay, Joe Silva's gone fine. Shelby's there is close enough. It's not quite that, you know, you don't got that symbiotic relationship that's been that core. I mean, that core of the UFC was Silva, White, and Fertitta just kind of, they were the spine, uh, you know, the nervous system of the whole company for all those years. You lost two of the three synapses. You know, it's going to take Dana time to fire with the other ones and then to remove all everybody else. Like, 
I'm sure there's still a lot of people we don't know about that are fine and sure. are still there. But it, from the outside, yeah. again, it looks just like, oh, wow, you guys just decided uh, that you're not going to basically uh, have the same company at all. I really hope that you guys know what you're doing because it's not just Dana White that makes this thing work. Yeah, it's a, I mean, UFC is claiming it's less than 15% of the workforce is being let go, which doesn't sound that drastic. They're keeping 85% of their people, but it depends who the people are. <laughs> and when you've got whatever, 400 employees, 15% is still 60 people. It, but, um, I mean, we, we only named five or six. Yeah, and, and um, I, who are going to be the other and, people? And, I, and I will say that setting aside the names that I know, uh, here in uh, the United States, and again, I, I don't exactly even know what they necessarily do, other than they've been around for a long time. I think a lot of the people that are being let go and being changed up, we, you know, we hear they're like international offices and places like that. Those people are, it's probably far less important that they understand the sport because they're not the ones booking and running the thing. They're essentially purely marketing type of uh, wings and if that's that's what uh, W M E I N G there, that's what they do. Like that's their bread and butter, and they're probably light years better than anybody, I guess, from their clientele list. That you know, marketing stars and making that stuff happen. So they may already have their own pre existing structures in place there, and maybe that's exactly. Maybe it's just a parallel running through here in the United States, and that explains why it'd be not a huge drastic overhaul because. If it's, you know, when you see mass firings, it's because the company itself is in trouble. Well, it's just a little, like, not that many. That's a lot of upper management types. And, uh, for once, it's good to not be the big guy in a company. Huh. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, to me, I mean, my initial reaction is they're trimming some fat here. You know, who, who knows what the bonus system was for Gary Cook or how much he was getting paid, um, to basically, like, run the, you know, the European section of the company. Um, and it seems like they're doing less shows. Maybe they're going to be a little more U.S. based now. Um, they got rid of Tom Wright, GSP's, um, a question mark. Rory McDonald's gone. Maybe they won't run as many shows in Canada. Maybe they're going to be more focused on the States and travel a little less and maybe go a little less globally and fo focus more domestically. Um, I, I don't know, but to me, my initial reaction was, wow, they're letting go of their most highly paid people and are going to put people in who are cheaper and try and save some money that way. Yeah, like I say, I mean, I, uh, there's so much of this is, you know, literally back, uh, back boardroom, backyard boardroom talk, whatever. I don't know what the hell I'm trying to say. It's <laughs> and, it, and it's total conjecture on my part, but just from, you know, seeing similar things in the past. I mean, that that's usually what you do. And I, I just know that, that that debt and the money they owe is probably weighing on them, and that's their top concern. they got to make money. So you hopefully increase your profits and reduce your costs. And, you know, payroll is a cost, unfortunately, of doing business. How about, how about you fire the assholes in your own company that fucked up and apparently put you in a financial jam right away? <laughs> Like you bought, like you bought the thing in July, and it's already a, a, a white elephant. How did that, that's like almost impossible? What kind of morons yeah. are and, you? And especially because, especially because they're more popular now than they've ever been. I mean, that, that's yeah. the thing with with all this like doomsday. The new owners, they're firing everybody. The company's hotter than it has ever been. Yeah, they, they, it's they, the craziest they, they part of it. They technically own it since right before UFC 200. So they had UFC 200, yeah. 202, they love 205, they love 206, they love Ronda. I mean, holy crap, these guys are like the murderer's row. If you consider them a new promoter, no promoter in history has had that great a batting average when it comes to successful pay-per-views. <laughs> no. Um, I, I, on the topic of saving money, we're, we're going to totally change gears here. Um it was reported everywhere, and Dana White even even confirmed that Conor McGregor was being fined one hundred and fifty thousand dollars by the Nevada Athletic Commission, you know, for the water bottle throwing, and then there was a Monster Energy drink in there uh, prior to UFC two hundred two with the Diaz camp. Um, well, it turns out everyone had it wrong, apparently. 
Um, <laughs> NAC executive director Bob Bennett claims McGregor was only fined seventy five thousand dollars, and apparently the additional seventy five thousand was a figure given for GSP's future uh, public service announcement work. Uh, it's not money McGregor will actually have to put forward. What does this make any sense to you? No. Had you heard that? What, what the, f- the, the? They're saying he he was only going to pay him seventy five. Right. K and the that other seventy five K is a figure given to his future PSA work. So that's are, what are, are, that's what they okay, gain the so, value so, of that one. So they're saying that they're his he owes them one hundred fifty thousand dollars. They're going to take half of it in mm-hmm. cash now. And they're going to take the other half in barter, and the barter is him acting. And they're valuing his acting in the PSA at seventy five thousand dollars. Yeah. That's a really, really, really weird way to do things. Like that, that must. That's that, that, but that is Nevada. That's, uh. I don't know, maybe 75 grand is what it would cost to get them to do a PSA. Hey, kids, don't bully it and don't throw things in I the mean, classroom. I don't know. The, the weirdest part was it was like, it's almost like they're backpedaling because of the, the public outcry. I mean, granted, there's not a petition to save Connor the money. Like, you know, with, with uh, uh, Nick Diaz um, after the five-year suspension. It's not that big of a public outcry, but people are like, for the most part, that's ridiculous. 150 grand for the for those water bottles. Um, Hold on. I, I'm trying to figure, on top, I, I might be able to find, figure this out. Say he makes $40 okay. million a year. That's $770,000 a week. So to get to 75, uh, wait, if we take, uh, should I divide that by 40, maybe? Is that what I would do that? Uh, that'd be nineteen thousand two hundred thirty dollars per hour on a forty okay. forty hour work week, and so they're basically figuring he's going to spend about three and a half hours shooting this thing, and that's okay. uh, that's where they get their number from. I really, really hope that's their justification for this. The I, the the other option is McGregor said he wasn't going to ever fight in Nevada again. <laughs> Granted, I thought that was just pure, you know, bluster on his part. But maybe that they are concerned that because the thing that's weird about the whole state athletic commission thing, especially with Nevada, is they didn't try and suspend McGregor because they wanted to fight in Nevada. They want him there because he brings in a ton of revenue to the casinos, the hotels, the restaurants. When he's in town, more people come to town, they watch him fight, and they spend money in the, in Vegas. So they don't want McGregor out for any lengthy period of time. They want him to fight. So that's why they fine him instead of suspending him or, you know, taking his license away. Um, and, and maybe they're like, you know what? Maybe he'll fight some. Maybe he'll fight in New York again. We, we want him in Vegas. He brings in millions of dollars to the city. Yeah, I, that, that and you know Pat Lindvall though is I think just a power hungry harpy. She, she's like a <laughs> she's a siren in the ocean, and but she does is she sings songs and then she sucks your power like a succubus. So that's her role in, wow. in the world. Yeah, I went to a lot of different uh, evil female archetypes for that there. Yeah, I was hoping for like a Medusa. I there. thought about it, but she kind of kills more. And I was trying to use, you know, you got to take the power from the people. I don't know if that's what Medusa <laughs> gotcha. does. So, yeah, another uh, bizarre situation for the Nevada Athletic Commission. Uh, nothing new there. Standard practice for them. Um, there was also, speaking of McGregor, while we're on on that topic, we got to talk about him every week. Um, did you see the story with uh, Gegard Mousasi claiming that McGregor threatened him with a knife? There's something weird via like Twitter that. Like, and a direct message. Yeah. yeah, it's really weird. Yeah, I, I got, it's very I bizarre. I kind of skimmed over it on my reason. Like, what, the, what the fuck? That's what the hell are you talking about? Musasi's trying to make some noise. He was at that post fight presser um after the Vitor win and he was talking it up a little bit, trying to, you know, get some press. Good for him. But now it's like seriously, like you're arguing with McGregor through DM on Twitter and claiming he's gonna pull a knife on you. Yeah. Now he wants to fight Nick Diaz and he's just trying to and 
to a degree, it's okay. We're talking about him. It's working. But it's kind of like the Jeremy Stevens effect. Is this going to help him make more money or make I, I him think, a big star? I think star? it, makes you, I I think it makes, makes you look really sad. Like, if you're Jeremy Stevens, he got owned. <laughs> but at least he got owned, yeah. but he's in the division. So, okay, that he can be right. like, hey, I'm trying to build up a fight. You're 185 pounds and you're just mentioning Connor's name. You're not, you have no justifiable reason for mentioning him. Unless somebody uh-huh. directly asks you, what do you think about it? There's no reason to bring right. him up because you're never going to fight Conor McGregor unless you think that yeah. you're going to somehow like trick us all into thinking there's going to be some magic Gagar Musasi Conor McGregor dream f- fight. You know, come on, just shut up. It's just, it's so pathetic to, it, it's just makes as much sense as invoking Ronda Rousey. Like talk, like, are we going to build a fight <laughs> with you and Ronda? No, it's just never going to happen. Shut up, you idiot. So it, it's just, yeah, I mean, there's plenty of guys in your division. You got Michael Bisbing. He he ain't, you know, uh, counter level star or anything, but he's counter level talking. Like he'll give in, you, you took, you call out Bisbing? He'll fucking jump on that in a second. He'll take a fight with Gaker Musasi if Musasi talks trash over, uh, Chris Weidman just standing there like pain on the wall. <laughs> uh, speaking of, <clears throat> Twitter feuds and beefs. Um, and we, we started off with this and I'm going to go back to it, but it, it relates to MMA. Hillary, Hillary Clinton put out a video about Donald Trump's ties to Russia. Uh, and it mentioned a possible connection between Fedor, Vladimir P- Putin, and Trump. Did it, did you get the opportunity to watch that video? Uh, no, uh, but I kind of, it, wait, was the video was a whole video about, was that all about that? It was, or was like, that just a it, part it was like eight minutes long, but it was different oh, stuff. Okay, Fedor okay. was only in a brief. Okay, no, no. But it mentioned that Fedor and Putin were friends and, I mean, obviously, the, the thing with affliction's weird because I've read and heard different stuff that Trump invested in he it. Didn't invest, and I've seen other things he didn't invest he didn't. shit. It's just like all of his other I, investments. Him, yeah, I mean, I've, I've read conflicting things, I guess is what I, I'm trying to say. But either way, he was involved in affliction. I'm not saying he paid Fedor directly, but Fedor and him sort of work together. Oh, yeah. in pictures I, together. I'm sure, shaking I'm sure he was basically, I'm sure Trump was basically paid to do it. I wouldn't be surprised at all that they gave Trump money to show up and make it look at him to talk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I'm th- thinking about investing in this. This looks really good, and uh, then it makes them look like they're hot shit. Because otherwise, I don't know. It's just weird. I mean, I, I understand the funniness of like he knew Fyodor, and Fyodor knows Putin, and therefore, like the idea that Fyodor Yemelianenko is the linchpin in the secret Trump and Putin. Pipeline. Like, if it wasn't for this one obscure cage fighter, Trump and Putin would never have an opportunity to talk to each other. They would never be able to find common ground except for Fyodor. It's just amazing that he is in, like, a Hillary Clinton (laughs) campaign video. Do you know what I mean? Like... It, and like Hillary's the more sane candidate, and she's got Fedor in a video that like her. I mean, I shouldn't say her. It's her team of a hundred people who decided and voted on this thing and put it together. But even so, it's like unbelievable. Um, What's really funny uh, is like I wonder if when they saw that, I mean, maybe once, maybe somebody knew USA or whatever. But I'm gonna presume that like diehard Hillary Clinton staff members doing this stuff lived in D.C probably don't watch a lot of pop culture shit so my mm. guess is they probably thought saw that and was like hey that looks kind of shady and thought that it was like really obscure like eh, we found something completely out of context turns out donald trump was just walking by and shook a hand we'll just pretend like it's something but instead they actually found something like kind of substantive like trump was involved in a major league challenge to the ufc and they don't even really understand that there's like a lot of people watching that going, hey, I know that fighter. Like, that they actually may have made this a bigger story than it is. <laughs> Maybe. Um, but yeah, it, it, it was, it was something else. Um, MMA continues to be, uh, plus, bigger and plus bigger. Uh, I don't know who it was. I don't know if somebody sent me, but they dug up, uh, the tweet from the night that Ronda Rousey lost and Donald Trump tweeted out, Ronda Rousey oh, just, yeah, that, that yeah, there's you. just got beat. Yep. She, she lost. What a lose. She's not a good person. And I've just been fixated on that ever since. Cause I love the idea that 
I think Donald Trump believes in karma. He thinks that if you're a good person, you have things. So because he has stuff, he must be a good person. She lost something, therefore she's not a good person. I guarantee you that's Trumpian philosophy 101. That, that, that is, that, there's some some logic there, a little a little flawed, but there's some logic. Um, yeah, there was something. Oh, yeah, because I, I went back and I, I looked further to see why he might not like her. And basically, somebody asked her before the Kohea fight, "Oh, what, what do you think of Donald Trump running for president?" She's like, I, "I would never vote for a reality TV star for president." That was like before he had even announced, I think, his candidacy. And, and for Rhonda, it was it was a pretty simple fairly logical assessment of the situation way back then. I love that Trump would, uh, Trump would remember that, though, and hold that grudge. Some one-off comment. Oh, yeah, comment. like four months, four months yeah, later. Some yeah. one-off comment from some bimbo, as he'd probably refer to her, that he doesn't even really know shit about, and it's just like, in his mind, like, I'm going to get back at you. And then when he gets called on it, he always just says, yeah, I know I was fighting dirty, but that's how I am. If you attack me, I'm just going to go back at you harder than ever before. Oh, we're gonna miss you in a couple of weeks, Donald. Yeah, yeah, he'll he'll still be around. Um, so for, from this past weekend, there were two two fights we should talk about. In my opinion, my humble opinion, there was um, you know the Brazilian Jiu Jitsu god or maybe goddess goddess Mackenzie Dern. Uh, she beat Mon- Montana Stewart at 325 of the first round on the last legacy fighting card. Uh, it happened on October 14th in Dallas. Uh, she won the fight with a um, finish I, I don't think I've ever seen in MMA, but may- maybe I haven't been paying close enough attention. It was like a Oma Plata rear naked choke combination. Um, did you see that fight? Um, I, I saw the important finish and everything there. I didn't see what she looked like really yeah. standing up, but, uh, yeah, the finish is, uh, it's, you don't see it a lot in MMA just because uh, Oma Plata's themselves are so difficult. Uh, Oma Plata and Nogi especially is really difficult to secure. You can kind of weasel your arms out pretty solid e- easily, but if you're dry, you can lock it up. But, uh, when you do an Oma Plata, you're actually supposed to lean forward as if they would say, as if you're whispering in the other person's ear. So you're supposed to try to bring your head as close as you can to their head. And a lot of times you'll lock around their upper torso, like in what we call a seat belt. So all you really have to do is adjust one of your uh, our arm hooks and uh, secure a choke that way. So what she did, I mean, it was impressive that she stayed with the omoplata, that she blocked the roll, that she controlled her the entire time. Uh, and I'm not entirely even sure what was the the tap us from because that the Elmo plot was pretty nasty. Like her shoulder was pretty pretty gone, and uh, I know everybody's shoulder is a little different with flexibility wise. But uh, you know that happens when you you, you want to go on the ground with a shark, you're gonna get or go in the water with a shark, you're gonna get eaten. Not if you're on the ground <laughs> with a shark, you might have more of a chance. Yeah. If you're on the ground with a be. shark, don't tackle the shark into the ocean and then try to fight it. No, those are uh, those are words to live by. Uh, um, I mean, I I, I watched the fight. I, I thought she looked she looked good. I mean, again, she, she's green in MMA, but she's only twenty three. She's the number one ranked um, jujitsu fighter in the, in the world for women at the moment. Um, I mean, she even beat uh, Gabby Garcia once. So obviously, her ground game. It's going to be better than anyone else's in MMA. Um, I mean, obviously, there's some difference between traditional jujitsu and MMA because you can throw punches, and there's a lot more going on. Um, but she's already going to be elite, elite level on the ground, no matter what. Um, so it's just a matter of her, you know, getting some striking and some wrestling and being able to get the takedown. I mean, she got the takedown, and, and she went for an armbar early. And, um, kind of lost the arm bar and then was on her back in full guard, then just got that Oma Plata and went to town. Um, it was impressive. Again, it's on a regional show. Um, the woman she fought, Montana Stewart, was six and two. Four, I think four straight wins, four of them by submission, something like that. So Stewart wasn't like a joke. She was kind of game. Um, but Dern walked right through her. Um, hopefully she kind of, 
takes her time moving into the UFC and they, they don't rush it because I mean that's her goal to be in the UFC by 2017 um, so time will tell on her but she's a she's a hot prospect and um, might do big things in MMA yeah uh, she's I mean her it's really not fair to compare men and women's uh, jiu-jitsu accomplishments just because the depth of talent isn't there sure. but I mean, you could say the same thing in MMA, too. Yeah, pretty much. Um, but amongst the females, I mean, she's about as high level as anybody. Well, she is. She's as high level as anyone will have ever been in MMA. Uh, the only person in, of her caliber that fought regularly in MMA recently would be uh, Roger Gracie. I mean, even Damian Maya, in theory, doesn't have the credentials that she does. And we've seen what he's been able to do. So... Uh, and with women, I think that uh, specialists like that can get uh, they can get away with a little bit more. The women's game just sure. starts being developed. And we saw Ronda; she just pretty much does one thing, and she was whooping ass. And this is a little lighter weight, which I think will work against her. You're going to have to be a more complete fighter because uh, I mean she is light years ahead of most people. But you get down there; I mean, they're just going to avoid the ground. Like they're good enough at. It, especially the UFC, the upper five level, they're good enough to fight yeah. like men, if you will. Yeah, I mean, to me, the, the big thing with her is she's only twenty three. You know, at like twenty one years old, she was winning world championships in jujitsu, um, and now she's the number one ranked <laughs> jujitsu practitioner in the world, and she's only twenty three. Oh mean, yeah, I mean, this is she's got some time. She's got time. I, I don't want to say she's a freak, but. To a degree, she's a freak. How many 21-year-old world champions are there in jiu-jitsu ever? Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's probably fair to say that uh, in many respects, she, it's basically like taking a multiple-time Division One champion wrestler and putting them in MMA, and you'd say the odds are with your pedigree, you're going to do very well. Right. And, uh, yeah, I mean, she's young and she's outstanding and... Uh, well, you know, we'll, I hope she keeps doing well in MMA. I, I like to see good submissions. Yeah, time will tell. Time will tell. But I'd, uh, she's probably the hottest prospect out there in the women's game at the moment. So if you haven't seen her, you should check her out. Um, now we're going to go to the total opposite end of the spectrum. Uh, Shane Carwin returned to combat sports this weekend. I was trying to figure out what the other fight was. I'm like, what the fuck other fight is he talking about? Yeah, no, I, I, this is, this is even more obscure than legacy fighting. Um, Shane Carwin, um, knocked out radio personality, skateboarder, and MMA fan Jason Ellis with one arm. It wasn't quite tied, tied behind his back. It was more like duct tape to the side of his body. Um, but he knocked him out at Ellis Mania 13. Um, didn't get a lot of press. I can't imagine why. I mean, you know, some guys that get released from their UFC contract, they want to get in there as quick as they can, and they, they just take whatever fight presents itself. So I guess that's what Shane Carwin had to do. <laughs> oh, my God. It, it was ridiculous. He, he he hit Ellis pretty hard. Carwin's huge, man. He's still a big, scary-looking dude. Um, but at 40-something years old, his, his prospects of um, – you know, taking real fights at this point are, are probably, I mean, when I say real fights, you know, you, your top 10 heavyweights in the world are probably, um, done, but he's still probably got that one punch power and I know he's trying to get back into MMA and, um, clearly a few people saw this. So his name's out there a little more than it used to be, I guess. I'll say this. If I'm Bellator, I think that there is actually real, as much money as there is to be made in Bellator. Uh, I think there's real money if you just promoted Bobby Lashley and Shane Carwin. I yeah, think that that would yeah. just be uh, – it would probably even be kind of a fair fight. Although, boy, that'd be – I don't know. You know, Lashley's too old. He'd get, he get hurt, I think. But beat whoever Lashley's fighting this weekend. I don't know. Lashley is fighting this weekend, yeah. Some guy named Josh Appelt. Um, so, yeah – other upcoming shows um, coming up. Um, there, there's rumors of this. Aldo, Jose Aldo was apparently in Vegas earlier today to meet with Dana and the, the Zufa executives, whoever are left at this point, um, to kind of clear the air, talk about things going forward. Um, there was no real settlement reached, I guess, according to Aldo, although... 
who knows. Um, he says he's going to have more conversations with him in the future, um, but he's not looking to fight right now. But immediately after the meeting, there were rumors of a possible Jose Aldo, Dominic Cruz, semi-main event on UFC 207. That was the rumor of what they were going to offer him to kind of, you know, win him over and sweeten the pot. Be on the show with Rousey. It's going to do a million buys. You're the co-headliner. It's kind of a dream match with Dominic Cruz. Um, if, if that was the deal offered, would you take it if you were Aldo? Uh, yeah. I mean, that's a, that's Me a too. winnable fight. You've got actually one of the few styles that's really designed to deal with a guy that moves around a lot like he does. And, uh, that semi main event slot there, when all you're going to do is make yourself a bigger star. You, odds are you win a giant mega super fight. You actually kind of further legitimize yourself as a featherweight champion. And you'd be making all that money underneath Ron. I mean, I, God damn, you got you. You fight a uh, you fight like a wild dog or 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 a boar if you get to fight on the semi main of a Ronda show as long as you're getting points. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, again, it, it, it's conjecture, it's a rumor, but um, if I were Aldo, I, I would I would take that in a heartbeat. Um, I mean, it's not the best matchup, but again, it it, it it's okay. Cruz is a name. They can play it up as a dream fight. You know, the best 135 pounder of the last 10 years versus the best 145 pounder, excluding McGregor. I know nobody considers him the, the best 145 pounder, but, um, they, they could really promote that as a, a serious dream, dream fight. Granted, they're not the biggest names, but for hardcore fans, that's a, that's a sick fight. Yeah. And I think that, uh, if you're tuning in and you're going to watch Ronda and you see the semi main event is, and you're just hearing dream fight between two champions at the same time. And they've, you kind of, you know, you probably know those guys a little bit. It's not exactly, you know, Mighty Mouse f- facing Yoana or something like that. <laughs> I would watch that. Well, you're um, a monster. <laughs> uh, how about, uh, other upcoming fights? Um, there, there's this Fox 22 show in Sacramento on December 17th. Dana White actually announced the main event for this show. This is on Big Fox, mind you. Um, Paige Van Sant versus Michelle Watterson is the headliner for that show. Is that, is that too weak of a headliner? Or, or do you think something like that can draw on Big Fox? I mean, they must have looked at the numbers from her fight in the last Big Fox and came away that she was the big winner and, and did really, really well. Uh, I mean, I... They got a lot of shows that month. You don't always, maybe they don't want to burn a, a really big main event. And I mean, it's funny because like she and Michelle Watterson's actually not like a terrible mismatch or anything. Cause Michelle is better, no. but I think she, you know, she's coming up at weight. She's the karate hottie. It, it's weird because it's almost like they're too perfect to, of a main event. It looks like it's like, oh really? You're gonna put you're gonna put the two really pretty girls in there, but like they can both actually go and they're probably around the same level and like they could you know yes they're very they're attractive comparatively, but uh, I don't know I mean I can't remember what the other sh- fight is on that sh- there's something else on that show but uh, oh yeah this is this is like um, the team beat. Oh, oh, that's uh, right. Mickey Gall versus Sage North. That's uh, right. That's what it was. Oh, gosh. I, yes. That, yeah, this just has to be marketed as like, you know, New Blood Rising or something like that. <laughs> it's like an episode of Saved by the Bell. Um, it's UFC, the next generation. Yeah, there's legit only two fights announced for the show. Granted, it's still... You know what? It's only two months away. It's December 17th, and I mean, it's Jeez. October 19th now, so they've only got two fights technically announced of Mickey Gall versus Sage Northcott and Paige Van Zandt versus Michelle Watterson. Um, it'll be very interesting to see how, how that show does ratings-wise. Um, I like both those fights. I think they're fun. Um, I'll watch almost anything. Um and I mean, th- there's an interesting twist to b- both of those fights. Um, hopefully, they both end up being hair matches. So it, it feels like winner of each match is supposed to mate with the winner of the other match. Like, <laughs> like it just see. I just I feel like the USC is pushing really, really hard for Sage and Paige to become a real thing. I feel like 
Dana White dreams of being able to like market Sage and Paige. Like he's like the badass pretty boy karate guy, and she's the good looking dancer. It's like like some weird combination of like Grease Karate Kid in the UFC, and like he can like book weird fantasy things, and like they have like a, a like a fantasy dream house at stake for one of their matches or something like that. I don't know. Yeah, and Gall and, and Watterson play that play the evil heels like they cheat and there's like low blows yeah. and yeah, it, it could be good. It could be good. Uh, another another fight, different company was announced. I think today or yesterday. Um, I'm getting a little confused in my old age here, but Chel Sonnen versus Tito Ortiz is booked for Bellator on January 21st at the Forum in Inglewood. Always up to no good. Um, Thoughts on that fight? You have any opinion on it one way or the yeah, other? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's Chael moving up in weight, but really giving up a little bit of size, but he's younger and better, and I don't know. It, it doesn't really bother me that much, because I don't feel like it's being presented as we're really showing you, we're, you know, we're not putting Chael in there with somebody legitimate. We understand we have a steroid user we're going to put up against their big-headed monkey over here, and yeah, it'll it'll work itself out, and they'll talk the appropriate amount of trash. And let's face it, Tito and Stefan Bonner did really well. This will dwarf that. So, yeah, I mean, it's, battle, it's the Jay, battle of the Trump lovers, though. Is Seven a Trump supporter? I, I, He's got I, he he ran right as there. a Republican once. So, yeah, I know, but a lot of Republicans are true on board with but Trump. I don't know, like Chael Sonnen is Donald Trump in MMA. To a degree, to a degree. Um, for for me, it, it, it it's really the biggest fight they could have made, um, unless maybe they did Chael and Rampage. Maybe I, I, I think mean, Chael and Silva, Vonley. I think that that would have. Yeah, I know. I, I I feel like Ortiz and Rampage are bigger names, though. And to just get the general, like I know we know the Sun and Vanderlei feud, and they were on tough and all that. But I I think that's more. I don't know. I think Ortiz and Rampage are bigger draws. Yeah, and draw just that's probably true. And they'll talk, they'll, they'll talk it up better than Vanderlei, that's for sure. Um, and uh, e- either way, I, I think this is what a, one of the better drawing fights they could have put together. From a competitive standpoint, eh, you would favor Sonnen just because Ortiz is Ortiz at this point. Um, do, do you think it'll break the... Bellator's record ratings are still from Bellator 149 with Ke- the double co-headliner of Kimbo versus Dada 5000 and Ken Shamrock versus Royce Gracie 3. Hoist Gracie 3. Um, do, does it beat that? No. I think that, I think no. that, that one's going to stand for a long time. Like that, like yeah. That's a total freak show number. It, there's only yeah. so many times you can feature a match for... Within sixty days, both of the men involved will have died at one time or another. Like these are special circumstances, and uh, yeah, I mean, Chael and, and Tito will be fine, but that's not Hoist and Ken. That's not Kimbo and a guy with an, a number in his name. Like it's just, it doesn't appeal in the same way. Yeah, maybe there'll be something else on the undercard that that can boost it up. But I I, I would anticipate being the set, maybe the second biggest show they've ever done, um, and, and maybe close to Kimbo Dada. It depends what the the obviously the last couple of days of promotion and um, how much trash they're talking. I just feel like Sonnen's going to lay into Ortiz, and it's gonna it's gonna be a a one sided drubbing in the cage and outside of the cage. But we we, we shall see. Um, I just don't think Ortiz can hang with Sun and when he's laying into him, um, verbally, especially. Um, so th- this weekend there, there is a show, there, there's a Bellator show, um, Friday night, October 21st in Memphis at the FedEx Forum. Um, not a major show by any, any stretch. Um, no tent pole here. Uh, the main event is Kendall Grover's Alexander Schlemenko. Um, that's the main event. That's what they got. Um, Kendall Grove. <laughs> Has been around forever. It's it's crazy. He he's. Still, I feel like he should be way older than he is. Um, and then you know you got Schlemenko, um, who lost to Tito and got bagged for um, some kind of That's steroid. Just, I forget. He's back? Didn't he get like three years or something? Yeah, I think he fought. Okay. And they they brought it down. Um, then uh, you've also got Bobby Lashley versus Josh Appel. 
Uh, Hisaki Kato is on the card. He had that um, knockout a while ago. Um, that was pretty impressive. Oh, who was he fighting? Um, the kickboxer out of the Diaz camp. Um, oh, uh, Joe there, Schilling. Yeah, a, a, a like knockout of the year candidate versus Joe Schilling. Um, so he's kind of fun to watch sometimes. Ryan Couture's on the undercard, and so is Baby Slice. I, I want Couture's son to fight Kimbo's son at some point. Um, that just seems like it should happen, I feel like. That, that, that's uh, just weird. Like, like <laughs> I, I, I can accept, okay, the guys I watched growing up, kind of whatever, like they're going to be old enough to have kids on the show, and Randy is especially old, and, and Kimbo's not exactly young either. Well, he's not anything now. But, like, of all, like, the just two completely opposite ends of the spectrum, trashy Street Fighter, Olympic hero, and their sons are the ones that are on the same card at the same time. Yeah. Um, and I know we touched on this in the past when they they first signed, um, I call him Baby Slice. Um, I think it's Kevin Ferguson Jr. is his legitimate baby, real baby name. Baby Slice is way his better. Birth name. <laughs> on the birth certificate, it says Baby Slice. Um, sounds like a weird uh, kind of cheese you'd get at the supermarket, Baby Slice. Um, anyway... He's not on the main card. He's not on the televised portion of the card. I think he's 1-0 and as an amateur or something like that. He's got one pro fight. Um, so it seems like they're not exploiting him. That they're not really promoting it that heavy. It's on the undercard, which, I mean, to a degree is kind of nice to see. Maybe they're just helping him out, get him some money, get him a start, do a solid for, for Kimbo. Who he's do a solid for work. killing his father. Well, that. <laughs> Well, my concern, listen, my, my concern was they were going to throw him into these crazy fights right off the bat to get get ratings, you know? I guess. And it doesn't seem like they're doing that yet. I, which, I know, but it's like, it's Kimbo Slice Jr. It's not like the, they're really worried, oh shit, is the UFC going to sign him? Uh-oh, no. Like, let him fight in total fighting championships. Like, everybody else who's got to vie for a, a shot at Mighty Mouse. you got to work your way in your regional circuit, and then you get a world title. That's just how it is. Yeah. No, I, I'm with you, I, but to me it's just – the the question was, were, were they trying to just throw him a bone and do something nice, or was it more devious, like, oh, we'll put him in with some football player who's never fight and try and pop a raid? Yeah, I know. Um, they, they do seem – whatever their reasons for hiring him, uh, he's clearly not being exploited. I mean, I, so. eventually they will probably do that. I realize that, but so far, so good. I'm reserving judgment. I'm trying to be um, – what is it? Fair and un- fair and balanced. Fair and unbalanced. Fair and unbalanced is even better. Um, that's all I got. Did, did, did we miss anything? Uh, anything that's happening in in your world? Um, I don't think so. No, I think that's everything. Right. I think we hit it all. Okay. A- anything coming up on the side? Um, let's see. I have at least three podcasts I did in the past couple of days in the bag. Okay. I kept telling myself, oh, I'll publish them. One of my, I disproved the existence of infin- infinite universes while uh, answering the question of what is the purpose of life. So that's a pretty good episode. And then the other two, I talk about Australia a lot and kangaroos and aboriginal people. So yeah, it's uh that's what we got coming in the next couple of days. All right. <laughs> Sounds good. All right. So uh that's it everybody. Thanks for listening to this show and uh Matt will say goodbye. All right, thanks for listening and we'll uh talk again soon. All right, bye.